I wouldn't have reached what I've reached now without of being at the mill. And I kind of always tell my students to at least try once in their career to work in a big company because it will build your pipeline, it will build your references, it will build your contacts as well in networking. There's, there's a lot of work, like that's the fact. We are now experiencing one of the biggest uh, renaissance of visual effects after the pandemic. Unfortunately, unfortunately, the industry is too focused in seniors and on uh, experienced people. This is a, a, a huge problem. A lot of people confuse their passion with their work. And I think that is a big issue, you know. When you go to an interview and you tell them that you are a huge fan of, you know, no disrespect, let's say Star Wars. I'm not, not, I want to make clear, I'm not saying ILM does this, okay? I'm not, I'm just making an example. Yeah. So let's say that you go to an interview and you say, oh, I love Star Wars. I've always dreamed working in Star Wars. That's my passion. I can't believe I'm here. I love ILM. I love this. I love Star Wars. As soon as you say this to the interviewer, like you are on, you are, you are screwed. Welcome on the show, Hugo. It's, um, yeah, it's a, it's a great honor to, to have you on the show. Um, yeah, I've been, yeah, meaning to have you on because I think you, you, I've been looking to find out a bit more about your your immense industry footprint. Basically, <laughs> I think you you have a great um, history and 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 journey, and you have a great influence. So I thought it'd be quite opening to to hear about your steps through which, of course, the the successes and possibly the failures have made you the artist that you are today. So. I'm I'm very much looking forward to 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 finding out about your your journey. So <laughs> welcome on the show. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I I you're you're being too kind. Uh, much <laughs> much appreciated. I really like your show as well. So congratulations for doing congratulations for the thank success you. of the podcast and for all the lovely guests thank you me. always have. It's been it's been a pleasure to see your journey as well. It's been a pleasure to see yeah, the likewise. podcast growing as well and seeing so many yeah. different voices being heard and being t and talking in this podcast, which is mm. something always so beneficial to an industry. So congratulations with that as well, Coffee. Uh, thank you. Thank yeah. You. So so, but yeah, thank you so much for having me. I, I guess I, I don't mm -hmm. know. Like I, I I don't even know where to start. Like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess yeah. For I mean, I, I'm assuming everyone literally knows about you, but. For anyone that isn't aware of you, just tell us who you are and I guess what you do generally. Oh, so. again, you're being too kind. Uh, uh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not, <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people don't know who I am. So I'll give you a brief introduction. My name is Hugo. Mm -hmm. um, my name is Hugo Guerra. I'm Portuguese originally, was born in Portugal. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I've been working in the industry since 99. So it's been like mm -hmm. 20 23 years now uh, that I've been working mm -hmm. in the industry. I've had a lot of roles in the industry, you know, like I've been an After Effects artist, the motion graphic artist. I've been an editor. I've been a compositor. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been a VFX supervisor, a director as well. Uh, so I have a lot of hats. Um, you know, originally, originally I did a, what we used to do in the 90s, which is I did an art degree. Uh, so I have a, right. I have like um, a master's in arts and um, so that, that in Portugal, of course. And at the time, like I, my dream was like, you know, to do video art and to do uh, short films okay. and films and this and that. It didn't, yeah. Well, it worked out a little bit while I was in Portugal. I did a little bit of that, but um, yeah. Yeah. I had to pay my bills. So I had to like get a real <laughs> job. Uh, I'm, I'm joking. I'm, I'm making a joke, of course. It is absolutely <laughs> having a real job. It is being an artist, but mm -hmm. not in Portugal, unfortunately. In Portugal is a bit right. more tricky to get a to get a living from being an artist. So. So yeah, so I left Portugal. Uh, left Portugal a long time ago, um, mm -hmm. and I went to Sweden to work as an After, After Effects artist. That was the only thing I knew at the time. I, I started right. learning After Effects because uh, I wanted to do some of my video art. So I started learning by myself. There was no YouTube at the yeah. time, <laughs> no YouTube, yeah. no no nothing. We just had to click until you find the solution. <laughs> um, so I, I became quite cr proficient in After Effects, um, and then I got a job as a composer in After Effects at that company in Sweden. I called Animac and then okay. worked for years there, became an art director there. 
Then I moved to London. When I moved to London, then I became a composer. At that time, I was already playing around with Shake. Um, and then, of course, I transitioned to Nuke. I've been using Nuke since 2005. So it's been, uh, it's been a long journey. I've been using Nuke since it's been available to the public. Um, so I'm, I am a very old Nuke user. All the, all the, obviously, people in the digital domain are, have been using it for longer than me. But I uh, started using Nuke 4 and moved to, 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 uh, to London. And became a senior composer working in multiple companies. I worked at Nexus and then I worked at Jellyfish and came into the mill. So I was like jumping around from company to company in London between those three companies. Uh, also teaching mm -hmm. at Scape a bit, uh, composting. And then I kind of like mm -hmm. stayed at the mill. The mill offered me a job as a head of Nuke at, over there. They were just transitioning from Shake to Nuke. So I became the head of Nuke at the mill for years. Uh, developed mm -hmm. the entire pipeline there and kind of build that department taking over from uh from Darren which was the old like the 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 previous uh, head of Nuke before me um I was first deputy head of Nuke together with uh, one Brookhaus and then he left and then I became the solo head of Nuke there um, and then developed that pipeline stayed there for years uh then eventually became a VFX supervisor at the mill Went on set a lot, supervised a lot of projects, uh, led a lot of projects uh, for commercials, for game cinematics, for short films. And then eventually I left the mill because it was kind of like not really working out for me anymore because they, they, you know, I really wanted to direct. I really wanted to have some creative control. And, and there was a big, big line of people before me to get <laughs> into that because yeah. the mill is such a legacy and big company. So. Of course. I loved working there, but it was tricky uh, for me to have some kind of creative control uh, while I was there. Mm -hmm. So I left and uh, became a director, um, directed a lot of cinematics and game trailers and in-game cinematics for games. My passion has always been video games, so I kind of like ventured okay. into that um, mm -hmm. and been doing that ever since. I, I kind of like split my time between being on set supervising either commercials, short films or whatever shows up been a very busy time lately <laughs> that's for sure yeah. and uh i split my time between that being on set and then directing sometimes commercials sometimes trailers sometimes cinematics uh, and sometimes short films um i've directed now 15 uh, game cinematics so far and um and of course you know i have my side gig which you a lot of people know which is the yugo's desk uh, youtube channel yeah. that that yeah. thing kind of like happened out of nowhere i had no plans uh, or intentions to do it Someone at the mill told me, like, ah, oh, you should have put some videos on YouTube. And I say, oh, what is that? <laughs> Again, I started like, <laughs> I was like seven years ago. Um, yeah. No plans whatsoever, Coffee, really, really, to be honest. Like, I had no, yeah. didn't know what the hell what I was doing. And I uh, yeah. started putting videos there and, and it growed. It's, people liked it. And it's now a, a, a quite successful channel. It's not, of course, yeah. I don't have cats on videos, yeah. so of course I not, not, don't have millions of views, but uh, maybe I should start putting cats on my videos. But but I, I, I have enough. I'm very grateful for the audience I have. Mm -hmm. And for uh, I, I feel like at this stage, it's 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 pretty much the biggest compositing new channel in the world. Um, there is no mm -hmm. really other channel that has, has many views, but mostly because it's the oldest one, I think. That's probably why. Right, of course. Um, mm -hmm. And then, I, as you probably noticed, I've, for the last year, I've been joining forces with Ian Fails, and I've done a podcast as well. Yeah. That podcast yeah. has been doing really well with uh, the audience. Mm -hmm. People love it, and I have guests sometimes. We Again, we, we didn't plan it at all. <laughs> Nothing is planned. <laughs> I'll tell you the story behind that thing. I was doing yeah. I was I was invited by Ian to do a podcast about the first new composite. And so he invited me over. Okay. Uh, this was for yeah. for VFX um, for his VFX notes podcast and mm -hmm. sorry, for his before and afters podcast. And mm -hmm. and we did the podcast, we had a lot of fun, and then at the end I turned to Ian and I said, we should do a podcast uh, like because we, you know, we, we get along well. We, we yeah. know each other for such a long. I've known Ian for years, so we've been friends for a long time. Yeah. And Ian said, yeah, that sounds good. And then I turned like I think either him or he I, or I turned and said, what about Thursday? Should we record something on Thursday? <laughs> and that was literally it. That's how we started yeah. the VFX Notes podcast. Uh, we recorded nice. on that Thursday and then. We've now done 35 episodes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, I mean, yeah. how can you stop that? Of course. No, I know. I, I've been, yeah. I'm having fun, and that's why I'm doing yeah, it. Yeah, exactly, and, yeah. And that's why yeah. I'm, I'm enjoying doing it. You know, he's a dear friend of mine, and we have a lot of fun doing mm. it. 
So I, I'm sorry yeah. that it took me so long to explain who I am and where I came from. No, I but I, I kind of, I guess that's kind of my story in a nutshell. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of other things in between here and there. Yeah. Um, also yeah. have a cooking channel. <laughs> but that, oh, that's wow. with Anna. That's with my <laughs> wife. Uh, that's Anna's uh, channel, okay. my wife's channel. She has right. a vegan okay. and vegetarian cooking channel. So I help her with that oh, as nice. well. And yeah. so, yeah, I guess check it out as well. Busy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Let us. Yeah, <laughs> you should definitely yeah, give us the links. Um, but yeah, I'm 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 curious about why the um, the Portuguese in, in industry couldn't couldn't um, enhance or or build up your your creative um, like um, yeah yeah focus um is 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 it still the same as it used to be or what's yeah what's it yeah it, so so yeah so unfortunately portugal is a very small country we only have 90 mm -hmm. 9 million people in the country so we have less population mm -hmm. than london uh so it's a quite tiny country and with that you know comes the, of course industry is smaller and there's not a lot it's a little, a little mm -hmm. bit better now these days i'm sure if i was in portugal mm -hmm. i probably would be a bit better off now but portugal has the typical issues of a smaller country. It's uh, it, the budgets are very small. Industry is very tiny. There's hardly any film business or any filmmaking uh, in Portugal. Most films in Portugal are or uh, very artistic. They're very driven by by uh, scripts and by storytelling. They don't really have a lot of effects. Um, you know, it's never been really a big thing in Portugal. We of course have a thriving commercials. Uh, 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 industry, but the problem really with Portugal is the payment is very bad. It's very late, mm -hmm. and I've experienced multiple times in Portugal not even being paid. You know, like like people right. owing me money and not paying in time, or or mm -hmm. giving you the the conversation of oh, if I knew it was this expensive, I would have done it myself. Those kind of conversations, right. you know. Of course, yeah. many times I had meetings in Portugal where I would present the the the, the quote. And I would get an answer mm -hmm. like, oh, for that money, I can buy a camera and do it myself. <laughs> and and so I, I kind of like stopped really thinking, oh, I can't change this. This is going to this no. is going to take decades to change. And mm -hmm. there's no way of me fighting it. Maybe I'll come back later on when I'm older. But mm -hmm. but I, I kind of gave up and I know I shouldn't. I should have stayed. But, you know, I gave up because of my own survival with with my wife as well, with Anne. And yeah, I wanted so to do other things. And so, unfortunately, mm -hmm. Portugal, I have a lot of friends working there. It is still the case. A lot of what I've said is still present, and there's still a lot of mm -hmm. problems there. Although there's a few companies and a few projects being done there. So it is it is better, but um, mm -hmm. that's why. Uh, it's it's not a third world country. It's not, but it's it's the closest you'll get in Europe. You know, it's like both Portugal... And a couple of other countries are, are just like not economically ready to have an industry like that, okay. you know, or even the mm -hmm. even the 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 pipeline or even like the infrastructure for it, you know, like uh, it's it's a bit tricky sure. uh, in that case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> well, are you? <laughs> yeah, I'm hoping. I'm, ho I'm hoping it will. Hopefully, as 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 you 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 wish it to be in the future. Hopefully the. Well, I hope the so. The and the, mi the mindset. I, I think yeah, the industry is definitely changing quite a lot, and now with remote mm -hmm. working and 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 all that oh, thing, yeah. like like things, it is. Abs I, I have friends of mine that are living in Portugal, working for the other companies, but that mm -hmm. is not really going to build anything in in Portugal, you know, because if someone mm -hmm. is like if someone is in Portugal, uh, remoting mm -hmm. to MPC or to the mill or to uh, a frame mm -hmm. store, they're not really keeping yeah. any money in Portugal. They're not really developing anything in Portugal. They're just loading a page and. The entire yeah. company is still on another country, so so there's still a long way to go. Definitely, it's a great place for tourism, a great place to live. It has a really good lifestyle. It has good weather. It it has mm -hmm. better prices than most countries. It's a lot cheaper to live there, so it definitely is a great place for you to work remotely. But um, on the other hand, remote work is also not not as you know. I, I have been remote working. I've been working remotely since I left the mill. So I've been working remotely for seven years, uh, even before it was fashionable as it is now. Um, okay. And and I think that 
unfortunately, the industry is still not really ready for remote work. You know, there, some companies are still forcing people to come back and, and some mm-hmm. companies are still obsessed with the fact that if you want to work remotely, you need to be close to the country or close to the company. Right. Yeah. So, and I understand that because of lag issues and everything, but it's still possible. Uh, so there's not, mm-hmm. it's not as easy. Uh, I think Portugal, mm-hmm. the only way if Portugal really wants to to get into this, they need to, you know, open some studios there. They need to like invest mm-hmm. some money into that, and so maybe some pop up studios, some smaller studios. That's what has to happen, and mm-hmm. it is happening. And, and then, mm-hmm. of course, the entire the 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 cinema industry in Portugal as well has to also evolve a bit and and of be course. a bit more digital, yeah. embrace a bit more visual effects, embrace more mm-hmm. color correction, embrace more grading. We still have a very old school, old fashioned type of a filmmaking over there. Um, so it's it's mm-hmm. uh, it's going to take a few generations to go through. But uh, but you know, coffee. The the problem here, I really think, it's that Portugal. You know, I, I was born in seventy eight, and Portugal only left the dictatorship in seventy four. So you know, Portugal was in a dictatorship on a fascist regime since the nineteen tens until nineteen seventy. Mm-hmm. So it had sixty mm-hmm. years of fascism where where you had 90% of the country was couldn't read or or, or couldn't read so it it was like it's a huge gap you know when the 70s open and then we started having freedom and we started having schools and you know i'm the first mm-hmm. i'm the first of my family to go to an university you know no one went to universities before that mm-hmm. so the country itself is still through this legacy of 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 uh, of lack of of education and also fascism. Obviously, it's a lot better now, but but it's gonna sure. take decades for it to really be as all the other countries are. You know, so yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. Um, I able to I <laughs> to paint as a picture of um yeah your your days, um, of of being in London in in London. I guess presumably, I guess at the time. It was, a, it was a hustling and bustling time in Soho, um, yeah. and and a lot of the, I guess the the generation these days are not able to to imagine or comprehend how how busy it was and <laughs> just how like amazing and yeah, just are you able to like tell us how the atmosphere was back then? Yeah, no, I I completely get what, and I and I also feel I missed it, you know, because I started doing mm. that in two thousand nine when I came into London. And I think I got the last years of that, of the Soho bubble and all the companies being, mm-hmm. you know, the mill was still on Marble yeah. Street, was still next to Frame Store. Mm-hmm. All the companies were there and everyone would meet on the same pubs and everyone would meet on the same dinners and restaurants. And mm-hmm. it was literally one mile wide, the entire thing where all the companies were. Uh, so mm-hmm. I think people a few years before were even experienced this even more, but it was exciting. You know, it was super exciting. My, my mm-hmm. dream when I was younger, was to work at the mill. I really venerated mm-hmm. the mill as the best place in the world, and mm-hmm. their commercials were mind blowing. I've always been, yeah. I've always had an affinity to commercials and short term projects. So I've never really, you know, I've never really w- was that interested in working in film. And I always liked yeah. the short creative aspect of commercials. And the mill was the place, you know, it was the top yeah. place. So it was my dream, and I, I succeeded in in that sense to have my dream realized. I never really thought that was ever going to happen. My wife never uh, stopped believing, but I, I never really thought that was going to ever happen. So I was it was a mixture of luck as well to be there in the right time in the right place. But it's really hard to describe what it was that back then because it was mm-hmm. literally you would walk around and jump around from country, company to company and everyone knew each other because everyone was just next to each other. It's still a little bit like that, but but it's a lot less, of course, because some companies have moved out to NoHo and to other yeah. places. But at the time, we were all very like everyone, all the recruitment, all the companies, all the departments. We would get out and go to the same pubs and the same restaurants. So, mm-hmm. and yeah. so a lot of meetings and a lot of development actually actually happen outside the companies, you know, in restaurants mm-hmm. and having a drink outside the pubs yeah. and things like that. And, yeah. but I I. I guess a lot of people ask me about those times. Um, I I don't regret doing them. I I owe my career to the mill for sure. You know, I wasn't, mm-hmm. I I wouldn't have reached what I've reached now without of being at the mill. And I kind of always tell my mm-hmm. students to at least try once in their career to work in a big company because it will build your pipeline. It will build your references. It will build your contacts as well in networking. Mm-hmm. But I yeah. I. 
I kind of felt really burned out. That was the that's why I left. You know, that's why. Um, I think, unfortunately, these companies in London, they are not very healthy. Um, you know, mm -hmm. they have very a strange approach to work. Everything is a bit brute forced. Uh, there's too many long hours. There's no overtime yeah. pay. So there's a lot of problems mm -hmm. on that. And I kind of like left the mill a bit because of that, because mm -hmm. not just because of the overtime that wasn't existing, also because of the long hours, because I would work, you know, in a normal day, 10, 10 hours, 12, you know, it would never really be eight. And sometimes I, I've worked like, at the mill, I, I, I did 50 hour days, you know, in 40 hour days and things like that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't regret being there, but I wish that I, that I would be more, um, I wish that I would, that I would have been better to myself, you know, because I now feel tired and I, I have a lot of problems that were developed because of those years there, you know, I have back problems. Yeah. I have sciatica problems. Mm -hmm. I have eye mm -hmm. problems i have optical nerve damage i yeah. have like headaches all these things mm -hmm. are things coming from working too much and not sleeping and spending mm -hmm. let, let me let me give you the approach when whenever you work on a company like this on a top level like this it's like working yeah. on a like on the fire brigade there's a fire every day yeah. you know like you would walk in mm -hmm. and there's already a problem going on even as mm -hmm. you walked into the building and so the the the, the stress levels were very very high uh, i'm paying mm -hmm. for that now i really Hope that anyone listening to this hope that they can take more care of themselves. Think, which I didn't do. Uh, I wish I did. So mm -hmm. really be uh, like, really try to sleep as much as you can. Try to rest and yeah. try to spend more time with your family. I, I wish I would have done those things back in the day. Yeah. Uh, there's yeah. nothing wrong with with working late and working overtime. I, I feel like sometimes it's necessary, especially if it's a creative project. But it was too much. It was too much in a row. Yeah, I think most of us are paying those consequences now, um, and I think those times are over. Really, I, I think it's gone now. Like it's not yeah. going to happen again. Uh, and companies yeah. that still work, still treat their employees like that, they 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 are going to be out of business soon because people mm -hmm. just leave. Uh, yeah. So yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Unfortunately, it was, it was a thing of the norm. I guess like no one really bashed an eye, an eye or really complain about no it. So i do remember yeah i do remember many days because i was i was in commercials i graduated from an animation degree in 2011 and like you the mill was the studio that i really 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 like love yeah. and really wanted to work for and i did work experience with them and then i came out of university and i was hoping to to, to work with them at that time but obviously they didn't have a position open so i, I couldn't work with them but um of course, I had my my experience and my my time in the commercials industry, post production, and just yeah, longer longer hours were just expected. Like weekends were just expected. Weekends, literally, producers would just yeah email you every day, every Friday. Yeah, I know, I know. It would always work. be like on Fridays. <laughs> I know, but it's 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 a shame because obviously, mm. I I you know, I totally get that sometimes it's impossible to go away i'm not a strong believer that we should abolish overtime and we should abolish mm -hmm. uh working uh um uh, late because i still as a creative person i still feel like that sometimes creativity um has no schedule you know sometimes it does work better if you work for a longer time it does work better if you stick around a bit more the, you know I, I don't believe that any of the biggest commercials in the world or even the biggest films in the world or even the be best video games in the world were ever made in time. You need to have some level of stress and some level some level of, of, of extra time because you need to like polish it and go the extra mile. So yeah. I still think that that's still necessary, but it's just too much. There's a limit and, and I... I hope that companies are listening now. I, I'll I'll tell you this, mm -hmm. Coffee. Like I I will never ever in my life ever again go back to a company where I'm in a in a in an office in in a table like working twelve hours ten hours. You know, I have my own company mm -hmm. now. I work mm -hmm. uh, with collaboration with other companies, and I work in projects either as a collaborator or as a supervisor. Uh, I've been very blessed to, of course, uh, have that now, mm -hmm. but you know, I'm never going back to this normal mm -hmm. 
nine to five factory work uh, mentality <laughs> because I don't live yeah. in the 19th century. I live in the 21st century. Mm-hmm. So for me, I would rather do something else if I had to go back to it, you know? Yeah. So, because uh, there are yeah. other things in life and, and if anything, like I've been working remotely for seven years, I've done 15 game cinematics that I directed and supervised while I was in my house. It's definitely possible to do good work yeah. from home. Um, if you have things in place and a pipeline in place, which I have. And I don't think the, I really strongly think the future is in, in, uh, in you know, like in artists opening their boutiques and their shops and having, there's always going to be big companies, but I think there's a lot of work out there and there's a lot of space yeah. for smaller companies to pop up. Because uh, yeah. not only I think I will ever go back, but I, I I really advise everyone as soon as they can to work for themselves because the um, that's what I've done uh, a long time ago. Mm-hmm. Because it makes a huge difference, you know. You do your own schedules, you can control your own income, you can control what you invest on, and you are not mm-hmm. living uh, on this process of trying to pay the bills and the salaries, you know. So, yeah. so I, I feel like I feel like there's definitely a place. Um, yeah for that you know in the future yeah Mm -hmm. yeah definitely yeah i mean yeah (laughs) in terms of um working late i guess i mean sometimes we we have no choice in terms especially being a junior for example you have you have the pressure to 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 impress or not impress but (laughs) uh, uh, maybe impress as well but you you have the, the the pressure to to deliver that's probably the right word (laughs) um and and so yeah you, you feel like you have to put in your hours and 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 just yeah make sure you're not being the first person out i mean it possibly probably is still happening with just juniors coming in fresh and they have a lot to learn and they make a lot of mistakes and they have to ask a lot of questions so they probably have to ask um yeah stay much much longer so yeah i mean yeah yeah which is which is a you know i i you know coming from from sweden working there it was such a different experience because they have a very different approach to life and the work itself and uh you know when i came to the mill you know i would see the runners having to stay late to learn flame or to learn nuke and they would have to stay you know they would have worked eight hours a day as a runner and then they would still have to stay another five hours or four hours to learn a software that I don't think should happen. I, I don't believe that that's the correct way to go. You know, like I feel like that has always been a problem for me personally. And and I always would go, got into a lot of fights at the mill because of that. <laughs> because I <laughs> I would really clash with the production and I would really clash with right. the management regarding this because I really strongly believe that people should learn in the job and they should actually work and get paid for that. And so I, I was mm-hmm. always rushing people into production, even when my mm-hmm. supervisors and my, my, well, I, I didn't really have to answer to a lot of people. The only person I really had to answer was of course the head of 2d in general. Mm-hmm. Uh, and of course the CEO of the company. And I, and sometimes they would get a little bit mad at me, but I tried my best to explain my position, but Mm -hmm. I would always rush juniors to production regardless if they knew the software or not, because that's the fastest way to learn. Never really believed this idea of you working the whole day, uh, serving serving coffees, and then you you go in and learn at the night. Mm -hmm. Main problem with this for me is because we're not an um, we're not an hotel. You know, I I sometimes felt the mill was an hotel because we had so much catering because of clients, Mm -hmm. and I I never really fully understood this really stupid explanation of yes you know if you work in catering serving the clients you will learn a lot on your no you, mm-hmm. you won't like you're just serving coffees mm-hmm. so i i always mm-hmm. thought that they should hire actual people from catering to do that you know like people that know what they're doing and yeah. and then actually get the juniors to work in in smaller things you know like smaller rotos and small cleanups and small processing that's what i used to do on my department my department had like at its peak like 30 people and I would always have three, four, five uh, juniors or runners or someone building inside. And I must say, some of them are now really successful compositors, you know, working in industry. So it worked. It worked for them to learn in the job. But I was mentioning Sweden because that is something I learned in Sweden. Because in Sweden, first of all, they don't really work over time. They, they are a family-driven society. A lot of people have a lot of kids. And so they... 
a lot of times at four o'clock in the afternoon, my company was empty. That was it. Like everyone would just leave really early. They would start really late, early as well because of the sun and the light. So seven o'clock in the morning would be the starting point, the starting date. And at four, everyone would leave because they would have to go and get the kids. And most people have three kids, four, five, sometimes even more. So yeah. it's a family driven society. The weekends were sacred. No one would work the weekends. I would never really work late. If we had to deliver something, here's a here's a, an idea. We would call the mm -hmm. clients and ask them for more time. And they would generally say yes, because they were also doing the same. So it's, it's a right. completely different society. There was never this kind of like gigantic rush to uh, to kind of like deliver for the sake of it. And I, I feel like mm -hmm. obviously a lot of studios in, in, in Sweden now, uh, there's a lot of visual effects studios. I'm sure they are working much more than this and they work a, lo a lot of long hours. I don't I what I mean is like they still work long hours, but they have a different approach. They do a little bit of that, a little bit less of it. Mm -hmm. They I feel like they respect a bit more. The working, the workers of the companies, uh, and I think just yeah. just a different mindset altogether, because it's so connected yeah. with family. Maybe maybe it has changed. I mean, of course, my experiences when I was there, which was between 2006 and 2010. So obviously, maybe it is worse now or better. I hope it's better. <laughs> uh, but yeah. um, but I, I feel like London and the London industry has a lot to learn from from European companies and from Nordic companies because they do work in a different way. Um, mm -hmm. They're a lot more efficient as well sometimes. I, I would feel that sometimes companies in London were not that efficient. I always felt like sometimes when we were do, doing a job, we would be re, like like doing the wheel again. You know, We would always right. uh, never really have a, a sense of building something for the future. It was always like a shortism, you know, like always short term and never, never long term. Um, and I think other countries that I've worked on in Europe or a bit more connected with long term, uh, you know, I, I think there's something in between. I guess we can't be as extreme as Nordic countries, but also we can't be as extreme as London. You know, like it's a bit like yeah. I feel there's something in between that can be used here for the best. Um, obviously, I'm saying all these things and I understand that right mm -hmm. now, as the time we are talking mm -hmm. on this podcast, yeah. there are enormous issues in the industry. Uh, every Almost every week, there's like flaggings of what Marvel did or Disney did or this did or mm -hmm. did that. Like, And I know that the problems are a lot more deep than the simple explanation I'm giving here. So I don't, yeah. so I dispense the hate because there's nothing, I, I'm not explaining the whole thing in, course, in yeah. a row. But I feel not. Mm -hmm. I feel that we do need to change something because um, the problems have been systematic for years and years and years, and yeah. we keep talking yeah. about yeah. them, but we never really get to fix them. Yeah. I think. Of yeah. Course. Yeah. Yeah. It's a shame. But yeah. So um, yeah, you've been you've been through uh, many studios um, as well as on many roles, um, as as you mentioned. Do you think that you were chasing a goal or some sort of achievement? Um, basically, I'm 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 just wondering at what stage a VFX artist goes from maybe chasing a dream or a goal to to the work mm -hmm. to the job becoming work mm -hmm. work for it. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just wondering. Yeah, I guess what kept you, yeah no yeah, but... what kept you going what kept you going and do you think yeah you you were chasing something. Well, I mean, I, I think I started as most people start in this business wanting to direct and to do something uh, creatively. Mm -hmm. And obviously, that's probably not going to happen. Uh, I've, well, I've directed multiple things and I can mm -hmm. call myself, I can call myself a director because I have directed multiple cinematics and trailers and things, but I don't really feel like I am a really true director because I haven't done a film yet. Um, you know, like a proper film. I, I did short films, of course, but. So that's mm -hmm. that's always been my goal all my life. I always wanted to direct. I'm not sure I will ever be able to get there because I feel like I feel like it's a very difficult task. It requires it it doesn't you know, I have enough strength on me to make it happen and it doesn't but it doesn't just depend on on the amount of commitment or even the amount of work you put in. It also has an enormous amount of luck thrown into it. You know, obviously I would also need to be lucky to be in the correct place in the correct time to get actually funding and to actually get the correct people around me to actually make it happen. I kind of feel like maybe someday it will happen. That's still my objective. But right now, uh, in 2022, if someone is watching this, 
uh, in 2027 or 2030. So we are in 2022 right now. I feel that I am very, very happy with what I've achieved. I'm extremely lucky that I that I actually work on something that I love. I cannot complain at all. You know, I'm so lucky and I'm so blessed uh, coming from a really, you know, I came from a poor background. I had no money when I was young. You know, uh, my mother helped me a lot to try to get where I am. And now, you know, of course, I have a full support of, of Anna, my wife as well. And they like like she is the reason why I'm still kind of doing things, and she's my inspiration for all of this. But I, I feel like if I get to do a film, I'll be even more happy. But I am already happy. If I had to die tomorrow, I would be super happy with everything I've achieved, you know, because I am a simple man. You know, I, I, I can't complain, man. I, I, I work in a computer doing cool things to pixels yeah. and. I'm literally <laughs> playing like I used to when I was a kid. You know, when I was a kid, I used to play yeah. a lot with Legos and GI Joes, mm -hmm. making scenes and battles. I'm kind of still doing the same. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just like doing <laughs> them in a computer, and so I can't. Yeah. Especially now, and especially in the UK, you know, with all the hardship that mm -hmm. people are passing through now, and all the problems we're having mm -hmm. with financial issues and the, the 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 crisis with with electricity and gas and everything. I can't complain ever, you know, because so many other people are so much worse at the moment than me. And I, I can't, mm -hmm. I am so blessed and I, I try my best to help as much people as I can. Uh, you know, I always try to do that. Uh, even on, for example, mm -hmm. I, on my online course, I'm always giving it away. I'm always raffling yeah. it out. I'm always, I have multiple students that I gave it. Like I have hundreds of students that I've gave away the course for free. Mm -hmm. Try to, to help as much people as possible because I feel so lucky and yeah. so fortunate to be in this position. So maybe mm -hmm. if someday yeah. I can do a film, yes, that would be even better because that was always my dream to do a film. Yeah. But if if I'm now going to just focus on YouTube and do the podcast, I will also be extremely happy. And mm -hmm. I I still can say that I still composite every day. You know, I still work in the box. I'm so happy with that. I will never stop doing that. I really love working in mm -hmm. in Nuke, and I really love working in DaVinci and and working in After Effects. I still do in Photoshop. Still do this to this day. So everything I do, even if I'm directing something, I'm still comping some of it. I'm still kind of directing that side of the project because yeah. I don't want to lose course, yeah. don't want to lose connection to mm -hmm. what I do you know so so I I will always do that I will always be in the box doing yeah. the job the shots with someone else yeah sure uh, mm -hmm. but yeah so I, I I guess this was a very long answer sorry uh, but I to answer your question I'm very grateful and happy and content to what I've done you know so yeah yeah can you tell us what originally drew you to 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 the to the industry? It's like what inspired your yeah your curiosity for, yeah. for film and and I guess effects? I guess it's uh, I have a different answer. You know, most people always say, "Oh, Star Wars, oh this and that." Like mm. I don't really have the. I I mean, I like Star Wars, but eh, it's okay. <laughs> it's not that good. You know, like it's it's okay. I used to like it more when I was a kid. You know, I I don't think it's that fantastic. It's not that amazing. I have other references, and I. <laughs> Sure. I when I was younger, I really just wanted to direct. I never really, never really thought I was ever gonna do VFX at all. Um, I was very good with cameras, always been. When I was young, you know, my my mother gave me a camera really young, and I, even when I was a teenager, I had a video aid camera, so I used to film a lot. You know, I filmed a lot, and I, mm -hmm. and that's always been present in my life. I've always had cameras. I have tons of cameras. Okay. I still have all cameras. Yeah. Keep buying old cameras as well that I used to have. Yeah. So so yeah, I always filmed, always liked to film my own stuff. Some of my short films I filmed myself as well. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it came from there. It came from my love of filming, cinematography, and love from certain directors. You know, I, I, I was truly obsessed by Stanley Kubrick when I was young. I am still a bit, but I now have other obsessions as well. But my main thing really was Stanley Kubrick. It was David Lynch and David Cronenberg. Those were like my three best ever favorite directors. I have all their Blu-rays. I have all their books. You know, I truly adore these three directors. And I, and I, you know, I, I kind of feel that that was my biggest inspiration. So it's it's very off from visual effects. It's a much more artistic driven and, and cinematography driven side of things. I think the the composting, which most people know me as a composter because I became so successful in Nuke, but I actually think of myself of a lot of other things. I'm I feel like I edit a lot and I film a lot as well. So I, I feel like okay. 
like those were my main inspirations filmmaking in itself you know the visual mm -hmm. effects came kind of like as a as a means to an end because i i had to make money and so i kind of felt i was always good with computers and games and this and that yeah. so i kind of like learned after effects really easily at the time i was a sponge at the time when i was young and so so i kind of like felt that that how that's how how my inspiration came about you know mm -hmm. okay yeah sure yeah i am um, are you able to tell us what you love about the industry and maybe possibly maybe what you 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 least <laughs> enjoy well i <laughs> about yeah i i really you know i don't want to sound like an old man but i've been hating and hating more the industry as time progresses like i right. i still work on it and of course i'm still on set all the time and i'm still doing stuff i'm currently mm -hmm. supervising two commercials and i'm getting ready for another cinematic and i've been on set a few times for 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 supervising some commercials as well so i'm still actively working mm -hmm. in the industry but yep. but i i i just am so disappointed by the industry i'm so disappointed not just for the way artists are treated and even the way i was treated when i was younger as well uh you know like I feel so disappointed the industry doesn't really learn from its mistakes. That's one side of it. And then the second side of it mm -hmm. is for me, I really truly think that some of the worst films ever made were these VFX driven films. And I, I feel like mm -hmm. they're, they're just not good enough. They're just not good. Yeah. They don't have good stories. Mm -hmm. They don't have, exactly. and it's very rare that we do get like a very good visual effects driven mm -hmm. film like we used to, yeah. you know, when I was young, yeah, we would have James Cameron's films, we would have Steven Spielberg's films, mm -hmm. we would have even Kubrick films a little bit, not the effects, yeah. but effects, of course. And yeah. I felt like they really kn knew how to use all the tools on their disposal to do a good story and a good film. And I feel today, mm -hmm. I don't mean to criticize anyone, but I, I feel like today it is too driven through content creation and corporate greed yeah. and it's really not really touching me at all most of these yeah, tv of shows and films yeah, I agree. they suck like i mean come on yeah. uh, I and agree. it's so rare i get so happy when i see something amazing with has been legs now mm -hmm. recently i did an episode of the podcast with ian about nope mm -hmm. nope was an example okay. of how you use vfx on a film it's amazing and it's completely invisible right. and and it's completely merged into the story that's a great example we've had many examples right. over the years and mm -hmm. we know this is possible i mean james cameron did it decades ago yeah. you know with terminator yeah. so i feel like yeah i feel bad that we are devoting so much time to do these piece of crap films and i i mm -hmm. i wish that there was more quality control i understand it's a business yeah. i understand they have to pay the shareholders but Still, man, you can still make money and do a good story. That that's still possible. Yeah. You can. Yeah. There's so many examples of the yeah. in the world of things like that that made a lot of mm -hmm. money but were still good. You know, so uh, so yeah, I I and I know taste mm -hmm. is completely, completely. You know, everyone has its own taste. Right. I, I understand a lot of people do mm -hmm. like these films, but mm -hmm. as someone older, you know, I'm now 44. I've seen. Mm -hmm. I can't unsee better films I've seen before. <laughs> so, yeah, I know. So yeah, we can like, <laughs> yeah, I crave, we craving for it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I've, I felt like that recently. So yeah, which yeah. sucks, you know, because yeah. you devote yourself so much, and maybe you've you've done an astonishing CG scene, you've done an astonishing composite, but then it's on this piece of crap film, and you're like, oh my yeah. god, this film yeah. sucks, yeah. and I just want to. Just yeah. never want to see it again, yeah. and I, I. Yeah, don't want my name it, on it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and that's a shame. That that is, I think, that's a yeah. true shame. And and yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a shame because I mean, as as they say, when when you have potentially too much resources, you, it's just the, the creativity and yeah. the, just the, the origin. Yeah, the the yeah. like film the 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 cinema history is filled with films that had no resources whatsoever and against mm -hmm. all odds made amazing achievements you know like if you just look at terminator of the matrix the first matrix and you know all these yeah. films had almost no money whatsoever and they still achieved mm -hmm. something that was monumental and and influenced yeah. all the films that came after so i feel like there's definitely still possible and I, i'm hopeful that sometimes it happens mm -hmm. 
But uh, yeah. and, uh, and and don't even get me started with the vitriol that is happening in social media about visual effects as well. The, not yeah. only the films, yes, the film do suck, but there's also this entire world of Twitter accounts and Twitter people yeah. kind of like just shedding all over visual effects just because mm-hmm. the sake of it, trying to pretend that it used to be so much better before when we had like physical <laughs> effects and this entire yeah. narrative of, of everything is physical, this entire narrative of hiding the visual effects, just yeah. like it's happening with Stranger Things 4 and things, the same thing happened with Top Gun. Like, like this, this, mm-hmm. this, this obsession of marketing and these companies to push this agenda that it was all done for real, it really yeah. bothers me um, because yeah. I, I, I come from... I come from a time where, you know, I'll give an example. You know, you go and watch the Blu-ray of Twister, for example, uh, which is from 2000 and 2000 or 2001. And it actually has an audio commentary with the VFX supervisor. It's like, that is unheard of. Like, it's rare yeah. to even have that these days. Mm-hmm. And I, I feel like there was a lot more respect for this craft at that time than it is now. Yeah, definitely. I yeah. Obviously, there's some exceptions. Like, I was so happy that... Uh, Eternals had the VFX supervisor on the commentary, you know, like Steve Soretti is actually Mm -hmm. on the commentary with the director, with Chloe, and it's a great audio commentary, and that audio commentary is actually on the digital version of the film as well, not just the Blu-ray, so Mm -hmm. so that's that's a a one-off that happened, I hope that more happens like that, but there is is a huge disrespect for the craft right now, which you're not seeing on the makeup department, you're not seeing on the physical, Mm -hmm. on the set design, all those departments are or considered really cool and everyone loves the work that they do, but there is like this enormous amount of hate on VFX right now, which is created from this Twitter world of like daily yeah. getting hangry about everything. And yeah. and it's 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 a real shame. So you asked me what was the positives and negatives. Right now, I can only think of negatives. <laughs> There's not much positives b- back there. But I don't want to hear. I don't want to yeah. sound like an old man. But I, I think I don't think I'm alone on this. I don't think so. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. It's like, <laughs> yeah. Tell us a bit about yeah your causes and yeah who get it, who goes there and yeah. Oh, I, the VFX next. Yeah. So I I. <laughs> I don't. I don't mean like to 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 promote much, but yes, I do have a new course. Um, it's mm-hmm. available right now. It's quite long. It's like 150 classes. It's like 75 hours long. Okay. It takes a long time okay. to do it. Um, it's not a right, fast yeah, course. No, it takes a long time to watch it. Um, so yeah, people are mm-hmm. interested. I do that course. I'm always updating the course as well. We always have. We always drop new classes into it. Um, so it's kind of like mm-hmm. an ongoing thing since 2018 yeah. you know since i started in 2018 yeah. with that course and it's still it's been like mm-hmm. four years and i just been like it's been like a project a ongoing project that i do with my students i have uh, yeah. 1200 students right now on that course wow. um we have a very thriving discord channel where we all talk and we have calls yeah. and we have show rule reviews together with the students a lot of my students since the course has been going on for four years I have a lot of students that now work on the top companies and they work on a lot of different companies that sometimes message me and yeah. and sh- tell me where they are now. I don't I don't yeah. I don't want to I don't want to like spend too much time talking about that. So <laughs> so yeah, so I do have a course. Then of course the the podcast yeah. it's is something like I said not planned at all. Um this is something yeah. created with me and Ian Files. Please go mm-hmm. and support Ian at before and after. He's yeah. doing an amazing job reporting yeah, in VFX because we mm-hmm unfortunately kind of lost a bit of that when Cinefax went over mm-hmm. and okay. and I, I'm really glad that Ian is kind of taking that mantle and having a magazine and actually writing so mm-hmm. much good stories and so much of it he's so active oh yeah <laughs> yes yeah I don't know how you I mean you both I don't know how you do I don't know how he does it because <laughs> no he's he's he's, he's yeah. something else he does like posts and and yeah. articles every day and i'm like well, come on man mm. like i stop yeah. stop making everyone look bad you know like <laughs> no yeah. but yeah so it's it's uh it's yeah. nice to be involved in that and and as you probably noticed on our podcast we are always trying to to show the truth as much as we can we show as much yes. breakdowns as possible we talk it through uh in reality we don't hold back on anything and we try to really 
this magnet like like really to put a light into the fact that both physical and digital are living together in filmmaking yeah. and this problem is really just created outside the set because while we are producing while we're on set and while we're doing the production everyone is just working together and everyone respects each yeah. other this is nothing more than just a couple of clickbait uh websites yeah. and clickbait twitter accounts to try to mm -hmm to earn uh, uh, clicks yeah. because of yeah. of this you know which is not beneficial to the industry but we try to we try to like uh dismagnify as much as we can me and Ian, uh, on that sense you know so mm -hmm. yeah yeah sure yeah 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 so um yeah through your your years of experience as as an artist and, and a tutor um and of course with the with the climate change in the industry um what advice would you give to upcoming compositors into the industry in terms of like what key things do you look for maybe say in a junior compositor showreel you mean like regarding you you mentioned climate change you mean regarding in what sense um so i guess remote working right now so if you can if you compare how we used to go through the industry through being a runner maybe from being a postgraduate going through as a runner and then of course working through the departments and then going officially going into the department that you're looking to yeah. get into. Um, whereas now everything is digital and you have to, that you have to like fight or so not fight, but there's finding work these days is quite different. And yeah, 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 it is. Yeah. So, so yeah. I, I guess, I guess the first thing I would say is that there's, there's a lot of work. Like that's the fact we are now experiencing mm -hmm. one of the, biggest uh renaissance of visual effects after the pandemic there's just way too much work i get emails every day from companies asking me if i know someone and keep directing yeah. them to my students directing to other people there's a lot of work out there so much yeah. that it's not even possible for me to even keep up like i i have to turn down jobs i can't even take them uh, yeah, sometimes yeah um unfortunately Unfortunately, the industry is too focused mm -hmm. in seniors and on uh, experienced people. This is a, a, a huge problem, you know, because back in the day, you know, for example, when I was running the nuke department at the mill, I would a lot of times, um, you know, invest on junior people to try to do mm -hmm. jobs and because they were in the building. Sometimes it didn't work out. Sometimes it did. It depends on the job. It depends on the person, of course, but majority of the time it worked out. Uh, these days, when people are working remotely, I think, unfortunately, there's a bit of less less yeah. of that in the companies because the companies yeah. are just wanting people to come in, do the job, and go away. And again, yeah. it's the shortism, like the short perspective of all of this because if you don't develop these juniors, we're going to have even a worse problem later on because oh, yeah. as we progress with more and more and more and more films, we're going to need more people, not less. So and the seniors, yeah. most of them, some of them are leaving. Some of them are going somewhere else. Some of them, you know, I'm not a full time senior anymore. You know, I'm I'm doing whatever I want. I'm picking my jobs. I, sometimes I stay away. When I look at a job, when I get an offer of a job, and I look at it, and I say, "Nah, this is gonna be a piece of shit." I don't even do it. Like mm -hmm. I, it's like yeah. if I can smell that it's going badly already, I kind of stay away. So the industry mm -hmm. can't afford to not train more people. I know some companies are doing it and some companies are really trying their best, but I don't think it's enough. Um, so I guess, I guess my, like, it's hard to give advice, of course, but because there's so much you can do, but I think younger people really need to like focus their attention. I feel in smaller companies at this time, at this time, and then maybe start there because then they can start there, build the portfolio and then maybe move to a bigger company. I'm not entirely sure the big companies are fully available at the mo at the moment because of the remote working. I feel like mm -hmm. sometimes they are not available um, to to actually go in. And I think that I, I guess the best advice I would give to anyone starting is to really take care of yourself, and that means not on a egotistic way, but on this on a team level. So. You are much stronger if you all get together. And this has to do with the fact that, you know, if you have issues on the industry, you need to, like, talk to other people and try to to get more people on board to fight on the same corner. This all comes down yeah. to, like, not just, 
like making sure everyone is aware of the issues that are happening, but also like it has to do with unions as well. I feel like people should be in a union because, you know, I don't really understand why people keep saying that we don't need a union or we shouldn't have a union. Every other department has a union. So if it works for them, it surely yeah. works for us. And I understand yeah. that some people are afraid of being blacklisted, but but if everyone is in a union, then, then it's not a problem because yeah. you can't blacklist the entire industry. So yeah, exactly, yeah. if we reach like 80% or 90% or 75% of, of unionized, then what are they going to do? They're not going to do anything because they, they have yeah. to get to do the work anyway. I think we should show our strengths in numbers. And in every single country, like Britain has a union, a visual effects union. Mm -hmm. I am part of it very proudly. And I think everyone should. I don't even need to be on it because I have my own company, but I am still on it anyway. Um, and I, I, I strongly suggest everyone to be on it. I know other countries might not have a union, but maybe they have a similar union that could work as well. Uh, I'm sure, surely you can find a, a union that could at least help you uh, with certain things. Um, and people just need to be more aware of what they're signing up to. You know, like I, that's one thing the union really helps me and helps most people with you know, helping with contracts, having lawyers going through them, checking your actual rights, because, man, I'm not saying the companies are not doing it in purpose. They're just trying to get more money. They're trying to to appease the shareholders and get more profits. So they're going to do what they're going to do. They're not going to do it for you. They don't really care about you at all. They don't try to help you. They are just there to earn money. And so they're going to hire you. You're going to do a service and then you're going to go away. You are the one that has to take care of yourself. You are the one that has to read the contract, make sure you have the terms you want. If you don't like the terms, walk away. There's other jobs, you know, or you can ask for the terms to be changed. I've done that many times, yeah. uh, even in the past when I was not even that successful. I used to do that as well. There's nothing you can always ask, you know, and get some help. So I, I think... I hope that the industry can stick together a bit more. And I feel like if we do stick together a bit more, I kind of feel that we can probably build a better industry in the future for the next generation. Mm -hmm. So late for our generation, mm -hmm. but maybe the next one, you know? Yeah. Definitely, yeah. Wow. <laughs> Great. You, you, you touched on the, the, the next topic that I was looking to ask you on. But basically, I was curious about your opinion on the common mistakes that yeah you see junior compositors make um yeah with maybe show reels and confidence and negotiation of, of salaries to studios but, yeah yeah <laughs> yeah, you, yeah you, I, I, I i i guess yeah. i guess you know like i've done many sessions of show reel reviews on twitch on youtube and also mm -hmm. on on my channel so people can go and look for those and, and read what I usually say. And I even have a video about showreels sure. on my YouTube channel. So the, the advice of the showreel is always the same one. You know, everyone says the same things. Have your best work at the beginning. Make it short. Blah, blah, blah. It's mm -hmm. always the same thing. Mm -hmm. So there's no, no reason for me to repeat what everyone else has already said. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy to find this information online. And if you don't find mm -hmm. it, just message me. Very happy to Google it for yeah. you. It's not a problem at all. Yeah. So I feel like the the I do feel that the big, biggest mistake really that people do is to try. A lot of people confuse their passion with their work, and I think that is a big issue. You know, when you go to an interview and you tell them that you are a huge fan of, you know, no disrespect. Let's say Star Wars. I'm not not. Mm -hmm. I want to make clear, I'm not saying ILM does this, okay? I'm not. I'm just making an example. So let's say that you go to an interview and you say, oh, I love Star Wars. I've always dreamed working in Star Wars. That's my passion. I can't believe I'm here. I love ILM. I love this. I love Star Wars. As soon as you say this to the interviewer, like, you are on, you are, you are screwed because now they know that you have no leverage whatsoever. It's like, okay, he's going to do whatever he takes to be here. He's going to accept whatever terms we give him. So if he asks for, I don't know, 250 pounds a day, or if he asks for 300 pounds a day, they're probably going to say, ah, you know, we can only do 200. And what are you going to do? You're going to say yes, because you've, you've mm -hmm. established that you will do anything to work on this thing. Yeah. So I really advise people to not take their emotions with them, you know. Obviously, the best approach would be for you to have an agent, and the agent takes care of the, of the, the contract. 
Obviously, I understand that that is not a reality. It's too expensive and we are not actors. So obviously, an agent would be better. But if you can at least become an agent of yourself. And so when you go to the interview, make proper questions and don't show your hand. Don't show that you would do anything to work on this film. Don't make those kind of demands because you're going to just look weak into the negotiation. So make sure you are getting paid what you're worth. You know, yeah. I've, I've been on so many uh, interviews where, you know, I was interviewed and this was after I left the mill. And, you know, I was interviewed by a few companies that wanted me to come in to work in film. And I came in and they would turn to me and, and I would say my right. And then I would say they would say, oh, you know, that's a commercial right. You need we're going to pay you less because it's film. And my answer would always be the same. Like, well, you know, I'm doing the same software, working on the same thing. So I'm not going to lower my rate. So goodbye. And I would leave. Yeah. And so I, I feel like you need to like stand up for yourself and know your worth. And for you to know your rate, it is not as hard as you think. For example, the union has a rate card. You can talk to them. The rate card they have is a bit low, but you know, you can put a bit more on top. You can always ask for more and lower it. You know, that's not a problem. You can always negotiate. You can also contact mm -hmm. friends that work in the industry. You can contact people in LinkedIn. You can contact your teachers. You can contact your mentors. I am certain that you can find the appropriate rates for what you're going to do on the appropriate country and never budge. Like, okay, this is the value I put on my work and my, on my, I am good enough to ask for this money. They're going to have to say yes. If they don't say yes, then I'm going to go to another company. And I can assure you there's other companies. And then there's another one and another one. So so I, I feel mm -hmm. like I really think the, the, you know, I don't want to spend too long on this, but I feel there's a lot of problems that could happen, a lot of issues. And you asked me what are the usual problems people do, mistakes. Mm -hmm. I feel like there's a lot of mistakes, but I think this is one of the most important ones. Don't confuse your passion with your work because it's not the same thing, mm -hmm. you know, like, your hobby is one thing. You can love films, but you don't have to work for free. Because if you work for yeah. free, mm -hmm. it's a hobby. It's not work. Yeah. So it's like, it, it, it's, and I'm not saying you worship or people are working for free, but they're working for too little money. Because even if you're getting paid, remember that, okay, imagine you're getting paid 300 a day. Okay, and you think to yourself, oh, that's pretty good. But then look at the terms. Okay, do they have overtime? Is it eight, eight hours? Is it 12? Is it 10? Is it no hours mentioned on the contract? Because remember, if you're getting paid 300 a day, but then you do 15 hours, then you're not getting paid 15 for 300 a day. Then you're probably getting paid 150 a day because you are working 16 hours on that day. So really do the math. And if possible, show it to a, to a lawyer, you know, a contract lawyer. I know it's a bit expensive, but or maybe if you have a friend that it is a lawyer, they can help you. But it would be worth it. I can tell you also if you become part of the, for example, the union, the British union, the 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 back to in 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 London, mm -hmm. they have lawyers that can help you. I've used them multiple times. Like I and they are they are free. Like they're not going to charge you anything. They're part of the union. So there's there's always ways for you to kind of take care of yourself, protect yourself. Because these companies don't care. They don't, you know, they're not doing it in purpose. They're just trying to earn money, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, good points. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how do I say? It? Yeah. Have you achieved everything you've always wanted to in the industry? And yeah, if not, what are you missing? What do you, you mean like if I have done everything I wanted? Is that what you mean? achieve achieve yeah <laughs> i guess there's a there's a different yeah there's, there's a difference between doing and achieving so i guess when you set off you had probably ambitions or goals or targets to to reach yeah to reach. i mean i've answered that before already like you know i answered mm -hmm. that previously a couple of uh, like about half an hour ago yeah. i feel like my achievement was always to direct the film and to actually be part sure. of that i have not achieved that mm -hmm. yet uh, but but I, I have I have achievements and goals. Yes, I, I wish I would direct a few more cinematics of games that I truly love. I would love to do that, you know, so that I have so mm -hmm. that I can play with the source material that I actually really enjoy. I really would yeah. like to kind of like learn, you know, a few more things in my lifetime. I would love to like know a bit like a lot more about Unreal and I would look, like to know 
more about uh, CG as well, which I don't know enough. You know, I wish I would do that. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's always a learning experience. I'm always learning every day. I always have books all the time. Yeah. You know, like I, I, I feel like, you know, like currently, you know, I always have, I have books on my shelves. I always have like books everywhere, yeah. you know, like, and I'm always like reading yeah. whenever I'm checking a render. Okay. I'm going to read this chapter or something. So it's like, yeah. there's so yeah. much out there for you to learn and develop. Um, mm -hmm. My passion is filmmaking. So I usually am surrounded by yeah. books of filmmaking. But um, but you can always find other passions if you love other things. Mm -hmm. But I I, yeah. I truly believe I will never achieve everything I want. That's never the case because for me personally, I'm one of those people that always want to do more and more and more. So I never really sure. I kind of you know those people that you see on when they die. You know, like uh, this actor died when he was 99, and and you see you go to this filmography filmography, and he's done a film like six months before. I feel like I'm probably going to just be, keep working and working and working, and then I'm just going to die. That's it. I'm not really thinking I'm going to retire or, you know, I sure. feel like this is my life and this is what sure. I do. This is what I love. Mm -hmm. I've been very, very fortunate to do something I love, which is very, very yeah. fortunate for most of us in this industry, you know? So, yeah, yeah so I'm not going to stop doing it. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, great. Yeah. Thank you for your time. Yeah. Um. But yeah. Um. Before we we conclude, um. Just just because I know you, I know you love your movies. So, what movies are you? Can you tell us what movies you're looking forward to in? Yeah. I guess the rest of of this year and 2023, and which movies or series you've 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 enjoyed so far this, this year? year? Yeah. So this yeah. year, um, I definitely think for me personally. The best visual effects film of the year was RRR, uh, which is okay. a Telugu film from India. And it's mm -hmm. by far, I think, an achievement in filmmaking with visual effects. And I, I hope it gets nominated for the Oscar. It won't, unfortunately. I don't think it right. will. Not even India submitted that to the Oscar. So not even they mm -hmm. did it to themselves. So I feel like mm -hmm. there's a bit of... A lot of a lot of countries don't really respect visual effects enough to to kind of do that, unfortunately. Sure. Uh, so I think mm -hmm. RRR. I really advise everyone to go and see it. It's on on Netflix. It's it's amazing. It's astonishing. I've watched it four times now. Uh, I've done podcast episodes about it. I really love that film. That's like by far my my favorite VFX films of the year. Um, I then I would say that I really really liked Top Gun. I thought Top Gun was a breath of fresh air. The film is nothing to write home about. It's not an award-winning film. But I have never felt like I did when I was watching it in the cinema, especially on IMAX. It is a, a, a really... A, it's an experience to watch it on IMAX. It is breathtaking. Sure. It's, an, it's, it's a true cinematic experience to watch it on the biggest screen you can find. The film itself, yeah. the story itself, it's okay. But the, the moments of dogfighting are just like, my God, yeah, they sure. were amazing. Um, so I guess the last film I would say I was I really liked Crimes of the Future from David Cronenberg. We already established that I David Cronenberg is one of my favorite directors of all times. Mm -hmm. That film is not for everyone, but I just watched it. I really loved it. Really liked Nope as well. That was a very good film. So those mm -hmm. are my favorite films. TV shows, though, mm -hmm. I'm really enjoying The Sandman. I think it's an astonishing TV show. Um, okay. I really think it's really good. Um, what are the TV shows? I've watched so many TV shows this year. Like I, <laughs> I think I felt like I've watched more TV shows than anything else. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, come like out of like like right now, I think I think Sandman is the biggest surprise of the year for me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. and I'm still watching it. I, I haven't did. finished it. I'm just watching. Yeah, it now. yeah, yeah likewise. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, what are you looking? Oh, wait, are you, um, Avatar, is Avatar on your list? No, not really. Or, or, I think Avatar is going to be fine. No. It's going to be okay. It's going to be a, a, an animation film. Um, I know we are focusing on films and, and television, but I, I, I spend a lot of time playing games as well. So I, for me, okay. video games has always, has always been a very big part of my life. So, so I, I, I always spend a long time. Now, currently, I'm playing, replaying. It's been the third time now. I'm replaying The Last of Us mm -hmm. Part 1 in PS5. That is an astonishing right. game. It's still one of the best games ever made uh, from Naughty Dog. Right. There's going to be a TV show from HBO as well, uh, which is going to okay. come out soon. 
Um, but yeah, I, I, I feel like like I should shut out that game as well. That game was astonishing. Uh, there's a lot of other games this year as well that I played. Uh, of course, I'm a big sucker for for cars as well. So I, I, I synced right. in a lot of hours to Gran Turismo 7 as well because I love racing games. <laughs> I have a wheel and everything. Yeah. I always ride this for, for real, you know. <laughs> yeah. I need to get one for my son. He he's, he's he loves. Cars, yeah, yeah, so. no, they're, they're, it's a my yeah. it's a game changer, man. The wheel, the one I mm. bought has force feedback as well. It's like my god, it like feels like you're actually racing. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, so yeah, be, be, before we we conclude, just yeah, tell us where where people can find you and. Yeah, Hugo's desk and VFX notes. Yeah, so so yeah, people can find me on Twitter. Uh, I have two accounts there. I have Hugo C. Guerra, which is my main account, um, and then I have Hugo's desk, which is my my uh, my YouTube channel account. That's my Twitter. I'm mostly active on Twitter. You can also find me on LinkedIn, of mm-hmm. course, as well. Very active there. Uh, just uh, holler, you know. Um, uh, mm-hmm. Try try to get to twenty thousand followers. So I only I have nineteen. 1,800 now. So I'm almost there on 20,000. Uh, so I'm trying yeah. to get there. Amazing. Uh, then, of course, Yugo's yeah. Desk uh, on YouTube, uh, Yugo's Desk on Instagram, mm-hmm. Yugo's Desk on Facebook. I have all the social media covered there. Uh, and then the VFX Notes podcast is on my YouTube channel. Um, and, of course, um, uh, I have also all sorts. I do streams every month as well on YouTube yeah. with new compositing. I'm going to start next month again, going back to my show review streams as well that I used yeah. to do years ago. Mm-hmm. I'm returning to them next month as well. Yeah, that's that's really it. If you find me, if you put Hugo Guerrero yeah. or Hugo's desk on YouTube, on Google, you'll find me, you know. Yeah. 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 Amazing. Well, Thank you so much. It's been it's been a, it's been a pleasure to 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 have you on the show and just. Oh, to, thank you so yeah, much. Thank you so about. much for having me. And I apologize. Yeah. I speak too much. And I, I I'm Portuguese. So thank great. you. So, thank you so much for <laughs> taking the time. And and no, it's yeah. it's great. It's great to 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 hear from from your pe- pe- point of view in terms of. I mean, of course, you're very passionate about about what you do as well as you care about. The, in, the industry and the well-being of of the artists, and you 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 fight for everyone. So it's it's really good to 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 see your your point uh, of view. So really thanks, thanks for saying that. Really thanks. It, so.